Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for uh, hosting me in this great city of New York. I love coming over here. I'm from the other coast. Um, we have a lot of material to cover today, and so we're not going to spend any time on who the company is or who we are, and we'll move right along, except to remember one thing. The pronunciation of the company, Barbara did it right, it's the most two important things in your life. Your mother and your paycheck, ma pay. Okay? With that, you can never forget us. Um, we're going to be talking about the installation of tile, large format tile, and stone for residential use, primarily residential use, for kitchens and baths. And working with a group of designers, typically on the design side of it, you're more interested about the one product that we have is grout. What color grout? And you tend to stay away from why do we have to worry about the installation. Let the contractor worry about that. Let somebody else worry about that. That's not our concern. What I want to focus on today is the fact that there's been so many changes in the industry. The way the tile is being used, the different types of tile, um, the different types of applications that if you're not aware of how it's going to be installed, uh, the types of products that should be used, when there's a problem or there's a failure, your consumer, your customer, your client is calling you. They're not calling the contractor and saying, why isn't this working right? Why do we have lippage wire? They're calling you first. And what I want to do today as you leave this is walking away with the understanding of there are a lot of questions you need to be asking before you just design or just before you specify just the product. So what we're going to be looking at are a few objectives. Why designers need to be involved in the mortar selection, the importance of sound reduction in multifamily high-rise units, the importance of waterproofing and where it should be used, the selection of proper grouts for kitchens and baths. Porcelain, the tile of choice. My gosh, um, in the last number of 15 years, porcelain has just grown in the amount of usage uh, compared to where when I started in the industry, we were looking at typically red body tile all of the time, very soft type of product. Um, why? There's the, the quality, the performance of it. We have a variety of styles, uh, sizes. We see the squares, the oblongs. Years ago, a 12 by 12 was considered large format. That was the basis of design for a large size tile. 16 by 16 is an average now. 48 by 48. I've even worked on projects where we've installed 5 foot by 10 foot panels of porcelain on the floor. So that's really getting into large format. And that opens up a lot of different installation problems. Um, advantages of porcelain. It's frost proof. It's easy to maintain. It has a high flexural strength. That doesn't mean you can bend it. But it's going to take more, um, it'll have be more resistant to movement in the substrate. It has strong rectified edges. We hear a lot of talk about recti rectified edges. And we're going to spend a little time on that a little later. But this, uh, being a, a porcelain, the edges tend to be stronger when they rectify them. It's resistant to wear and deep abrasion. And of course, a porcelain, by definition, has to be less than a half a percent of absorption. So what does that mean? Real quick, they'll take a piece of tile, they'll weigh it. They'll soak it in water for 24 hours. They'll pat it dry. They'll weigh it again. The tile cannot have absorbed more than a half a percent of its original weight. If it does, it's not porcelain. It's porcelain light. And be careful from that, on that. Uh, as a design team, you'll look at something really beautiful, really good looking, and you don't look at the fine print and you find out it's not porcelain, it's porcelain light. Uh, we had a major failure at a project in Las Vegas, the city center project, where the tile that they put up was a porcelain veneer over, um, or um, a stone veneer over a porcelain body. They found out it was a porcelain light body. The absorption rate was 24%. The tile was popping off the walls before they ever used one of the bathrooms. So be careful when you look at the tile that you're specifying. Porcelains are produced in natural, smooth, polished, and textured finishes. So you're getting every finish that you can possibly have, like in a natural stone, but with all of the advantages of a porcelain tile. So when we talk about large, how large is large? Like I said at the beginning, 12 by 12, when I started in the industry, was really big. Um, now, uh, 
five foot by 10 foot panels. And we're seeing some panelization um, <laughs> that's being used on wall format, very, very thin, uh, less than, uh, or right around 360 of an inch in thickness, and panels that are four foot by nine foot, four foot by 10 foot. Porcelain panels of tile. That's getting into large format. Some of the points to consider when you're looking at these large format porcelain tiles. Uh, the tile thickness, sizes, flatness. Um, make sure you use a quality manufacturer when you're looking at these products. All of these products, when they're manufactured, um, will have some variation in them. And a good manufacturer of a porcelain tile will calibrate the tile to making sure that it falls within a particular range. So that as you get into larger pieces, you're making sure that they're close in size. Rectified edges. I had a gentleman today, an architect in um, the Los Angeles area, called me about a particular project. And he says, we're going to be using a rectified tile. Can we set it with a butt joint? You can, but we don't, rec we don't recommend it. Neither does the industry. The problem with that is there's a multitude of problems. Is that the tiles, although the manufacturer says they're all exactly the same, there'll be some variations. And that little bit of a variation can take your line and stair step it as you look down that, that uh, line where the tiles touch. The customer won't like that look. Plus, a sixteenth of an inch is still a gap. That'll collect dirt, hair, all kinds of things that you can't get out. So to go without a joint is not really recommended. Stay with a, at least a sixteenth of an inch joint on a rectified uh, tile. Um, also take a look at the surface pro profile of the, of the tile, because that's going to determine the grouting technique. Are we going to smear it? Are we going to bag the joints? Are we going to have to use a grout release on it? Um, these are all different things to consider so that when it's done, when the grouting is finished, you've got a floor or a wall that looks like that piece that you saw in the showroom, done upright. The, um, another, another point to consider is thermal expansion. And this is uh, prevalent on exterior applications, uh, more so than interior, unless you're designing in a, a space that has a lot of glass. And the light coming through there and hitting that and causing the tile uh, to expand and contract. And, you're think, and your, your thoughts are, well, geez, it's a very dense tile. How much expansion can there be? In a 24 by 24 inch tile, on a, a temperature of 120 degrees. Now, that doesn't have to be that. That's the surface temperature. So day 80 degrees out in the sun, facing south, easily the surface temperature can hit 120 degrees. You'll have 3 to 5 tenths of a millimeter in growth. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot until you start stacking them together. And it can add up and cause a problem if we're not addressing that uh, during the installation. Rectified or non-rectified, um, they spend some time here talking about the butt joint installations. And I touched on this briefly, that they're a little more difficult, um, not quite impossible, to ensure that the joint is straight and uniform. Uh, years ago, on one of my first trips to Italy, I was looking at some tile installations. And everything over there, they butt joint, and then they put in a slurry of cement over the top. The joints are all out of line. Everything is out of line. The consumer doesn't care. They're used to it. We do that here in the United States, and your phone's going to ring off the hook. My joints don't line up. What's the matter with this? They don't recognize the fact that if you're going to butt things together, that's what you're going to get. So that's why we say stay away from it. Uh, stay away from that butt joint. Um, also with a butt joint, you have a, a greater chance of lippage. And we're going to spend some uh, time talking about lippage, uh, especially as we get into these large formats. It's a very critical aspect to be considering. So when we, we take a look at these um, uh, large formats, and we take a look at um, a few things that we have to consider in this total installation, and what we like to call this is stacking the variables. We want to take a look at the subsurface or substrate tolerances, or the wall subsurface would be the proper word to use, that we want to make sure that we don't exceed a variation of a quarter of an inch in 10 feet or a sixteenth of an inch in a foot. So that means putting a level on a floor if you're going in and you're going to be installing large format tile, and you're going into somebody's home and you're kind of being responsible for selling them this, making sure that this floor is relatively flat. Because otherwise what happens is a large piece 
a little bit out of kilter, and this end can be way up as they're installing it. And how do we adjust for that? Surface preparation uh, has to be done in advance. We also have to take a look at the, the mortar shrinkage. If you're using a large format tile and you see some imperfections in the floor and the subcontractor says to you, hey, designer, no problem. I'll fill that with thin set. We've got it covered. Toss him off the job. Thin set is not meant to build up a floor. Thin set is just that. It's meant as a thin layer of a bonding coat to bond the tile to the substrate. Thin set, by the nature of itself, like any concrete material, will have some shrinkage. So if, they build, if they're building it up, it will shrink. The more they build it up, the more it's going to shrink. Now, at first, you're not going to see any problems. But a couple of months from now, somebody rolls in a new refrigerator, and all of a sudden you get some point loading on it, snap. And you'll find that there's hollowness, or the thin set has shrunk and pulled away because they've built up too much. So you never want to use a thin set as a leveling bed or as filling up a dip or a divot in the floor. It's not designed to do that. There are uh, proper patching compounds to use for that. The other thing we have to look at is mortar uh, sag. Um, we use the word here, thixotropic. Uh, that will be on the test today, so remember that word. Thixotropic is, you're all familiar with it, it's the Heinz 57. You take that bottle of ketchup, hold it over the white tablecloth, nothing comes out until you hit the bottle right at the 57 and the ketchup will drop. Thixotropic mortar acts in the same way. You're spreading it on a wall, and for a large format, you can place the tile into it, and it'll hold. It won't slide. If you agitate the thin set, it'll start sliding. But if you put the thin set up and, slit and put the tile into it, it'll hold. We can place tiles 24 by 24, half an inch thick, up onto the wall, and it won't move at all. That's a thixotropic mortar. And this is also used on floors to prevent from sinking into, on the floor. When we look at tile warpage, stacking up all of these elements, we're looking at the substrate flatness, mortar shrinkage, mortar sag, how much warpage is in that tile or that stone, and then the, t the t weight of the tile or stone. And when you're stacking all those variables, this can add up to lippage. And lippage on a large format, large installation floor is one of the problems you don't want to have just a little sixteenth of an inch out of whack and somebody in a, a thin high spike, high heel catch that, they're down. So we're looking at ending up with a flat floor and what we're trying to avoid is lippage. So as you're looking at the tiles that you're working with, you're working with a larger piece, you want to make sure that A, the substrate is flat, somebody's going to check that out to make sure it's intolerances for you, that, the, that we're using the proper type of thin set, we'll get into that, we're looking to making sure that the thin set isn't going to stack, uh, sag. We want to make sure that the tile we got is from a reputable source so that its tolerances um, are all uh, within realm and reason, and then the weight so we don't end up with this total problem. The effect is that if you're looking at a small format tile, uh, it doesn't really matter because a lot of that can be hidden in the, the laying of the tile, and you don't notice a big difference. As we get larger, you can create a, a bigger uh, valley or a, a deeper uh, low spot in that, which can end up for breakage, point loading breakage, or a hollow sounding. And then as we get into diagonal patterns or brick type patterns or random patterns, you're spreading out and the variances in there can really cause for some major problems. Um, one of the things to keep in mind on the large format porcelains when you're work, working with the um, oblong pieces, rectangular pieces, is uh, instead of stacking them as a brick joint, where it's 50-50 on the tile, you should always stack them at the most as a third on the joint. The reason being is that the larger it is, the tile will tend to crown, no matter how good the manufacturer is. So that means the high point's in the middle, the low point's are on the end. If you line up the end with the middle to give yourself the proper brick joint, you're going to have a natural trip point. So always stagger off by at least a third. And that is being recommended now by the Tile Council of America as a standard type of installation for a large format going into a brick pattern. When you're looking at the uh, effects of the curvature and the load, all of these can add to the overall deflection. And this gets into the end 
The more deflection that we're looking at, the different types of thin set mortar.